Hello, welcome back, and thanks for joining us on our latest We Are Sunderland Briefing with myself, Don Shaw, and not Scott Wilson, James Hunter this week, stepping in from, I don't want to say the substitute bench, but thanks very much for joining us, Scott. Uh, James, sorry, much appreciated. Um, <laughs> You're very welcome. No, it's an honour to be Scott's understudy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks as ever to our partners, as we say at the top of every podcast and video. We, uh, the Fans Museum in Sunderland, and to Cospex Opticians as well. And as we always say, if you haven't yet subscribed to our channel and do click the button, you'll get a notification when all of our videos go live. Get in touch in the comments section if there's anything you want us to discuss in future videos. And if you're listening on your podcast platform, then rate and review there as well. And again, get in touch on there if there's anything that you want us to have a chinwag about in the weeks ahead. And it's a funny one, James, this week, because we go into the third international break of the season with Sunderland still top of the championship, unbeaten in eight. And yet there is that kind of, after the frustrations of last week's three draws, it, it maybe feels a little deflating. Is, is, is that fair? Yeah, it's kind of the macro and the micro, isn't it? So the macro picture, as you say, Going into the third international break, top of the table, um, you know, people would have taken that at the start of the season. You know, absolutely, this is you know exceeded people's expectations. This is you know a great start for for Sunderland, and uh, there's no argument about that. But on the micro level, people will look at the last, uh, not this week, but the previous week, the three games in in a week, three successive draws, and think, you know, what might have been Sunderland entered that week. Um, five points clear at the top of the table um, with two or well, maybe even three eminently winnable fixtures or so it looked on on paper we all know the dangers of that but you know it looked on on paper as though you know there was an opportunity to press home that advantage um, with games against QPR Preston and then Coventry and they didn't manage to win any of those three games two of them were goals draws away from home I mean points on the on the road that's that's fine um you, you know you'll pick up pick up a single point away from home and and that's okay um but people will look at that Coventry game going in 2-0 up at half time um and then to come away with just a single point um you know to to have um let it slip in the second half um and that really did feel like a a, a huge opportunity missed that that Preston game I guess there's two way of I, w- I was at deep down there's kind of came away from it thinking kind of how do, how do you reflect on this how do you assess it do you do you see it as a, a missed opportunity or do you think well some of them were way off the best there they're without several key players they tweak the team and they still manage to get to get a result um and and i think that's probably how you reflect on last week as a whole isn't it do, do do you look at it and think, well, they weren't at the best, but they still managed to extend their unbeaten run, they're still managing to get points? Or do you look at it and think, actually, are they losing a bit of the momentum from the early weeks of the season? Is this now becoming the norm? And we won't yeah. have the answers for that probably for the next two or three weeks, will we, when we when we get back and we're two or three games into the next block? Yeah, the, that's it. I mean, of, of the three games that we just mentioned there, the three successive draws, probably the Preston game is the one that I was least unhappy about if you see what I mean um mm. that was a good solid point and clean sheet on on the road as you say when Sunderland were way off their best Preston were by far the better team and should have won that game but Sunderland didn't allow them to you know they then hung on and made sure that they got a point away from home so that was fine QPR felt like a missed op- opportunity because QPR had such a poor record um albeit Sunderland played for half an hour without um, uh, with with ten men, with uh, with Joe Bellingham being sent off, so there's a there's a slight um, uh, you know defence you can put up there, um, but it was the Coventry one as as well, you know to to let that slip up at home at uh, at two 0 up at half time. That's that, that was the the real killer, I think. Um, again, you know we're looking at this from a from a point of view of, of Sunderland doing so well up to now. Um, you know, we're arguing about, not about defeats. We're arguing about dropping two points. Um, you know, and, and that's not a bad place to be. Let's let, let's not uh, make any bones about it. Sunderland have done tremendously well to get to to this point in the position that they are. Um, it was always going to be the case, and I think that you know, I, I think I've written in in the past that at the start of the season we didn't really know what 
we would get from these new players that came in over the summer. Um, they were unfamiliar players, to, I should guess, to to almost all Sunderland fans. Um, the vast majority of them, Al, um, Alan Brown and Aaron Connolly, um, probably being the exceptions because they played in the championship. But um, the, yeah, they, they, we didn't really know what we'd get from those players. They, they've probably exceeded our expectations. Um, as a group, even though some of them are yet to play because they've, they've been injured since they arrived. Um, the worry was always how deep was the squad beyond Sunderland's sort of first 13 or 14 players? Um, what's the quality like behind that? And I think that we've just seen in these next, uh, or, or we've seen in these recent games when there's one, been one or two injuries and suspensions, we've seen that start to bite. And and uh, that's going to be the, the big question that we're going to have to uh, uh, address over the, the coming weeks and which the club will have to address, I, I think, in January if, if they're going to press home and, and uh, you know put up a, a serious challenge for, for an automatic promotion place. We'll, we'll get to January then. But first of all, I think on that squad depth thing, um, in the early weeks of the season, that was we, we've all discussed it, we've all questioned it, we'd all addressed, yeah, if someone's flying, but what happens when they get the inevitable injuries or suspensions or, or fatigue and have to tweak with it. And in the early, early weeks, the, the signs were promising because even when players were out, like Ballard, then Elise, then Mayenda, um, when, when players were out, Rig missed a game. I think I thought, oh, oh, he was able to tweak slightly in midfield um, yeah. and bring Brown in for a game or two. And someone dealt fine with that. But I guess the difference was that was kind of one player out at one time. In the last week or so, you've had Bellingham out, Roberts and Mundell were both rested. When we come back yep. and we get to this, clearly you're going to be without Hume, Roberts, Mundell and Brown both went off. So it it's that accumulation of setbacks that yeah. has obviously proved costly. But but I do think we kind of run the risk of becoming a bit Sunderland centric with this. If if any championship team lost three or four of their key major first team players at any time, they, they'd they'd feel it too. Yeah, uh, certainly away from the, the the clubs that can afford to carry the really big squads. You know, the Leeds United, for instance, that that can that have recently come down out of the Premier League and therefore have a a stronger and wider pool to pick from. Um, but yes, um, the, the problem for Sunderland is that that certainly um, in the wake of uh, the Coventry game, they're, they're going to have a real test coming up when when things restart after the international break at, at Millwall, um, because they are. Um, we don't quite know the the extent of of um, the injuries to Remain Mundell and to Alan Brown, two players that came off during that game against Coventry. Um, but if they were to miss um, the Millwall game, that would leave Sunderland without five of their first choice outfielders. Uh, once you add in the the three players that are suspended that you that you named as well, um, that's you know that's going to be a real test. Um, there's no uh, obvious contender to come in at, at right back to replace. Trey Hume, for instance. Um, so there's, there's going to be a, a, a need for Regis Labrie to to do a little bit of um, moving around and perhaps come up with um, an unconventional solution down at Millwall. There's no there's no obvious replacement to come in a, a, a right back there. Um, so I think we'll get a better idea of how Sunderland cope in extreme circumstances when we see how the things go on in the next game. And because of the way it went in the second half against Coventry, obviously it, it is easy to forget all the good that had gone before. In particular, the goals. Dennis Serkin, we'll get to him with that incredible hit. But Isidore with another pearler. He doesn't score bad goals, does he? Or scruffy no. goals, you should say. There's no such thing as a bad goal, but you get the point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there have been some fantastic goals this season. You know, uh, you only need to look at um, Isidore's um, goal down at, at Hull as well, where he ran the length of the the field. The one was that against Oxford, the volley that came over his shoulder. Was that Oxford? I think. So you, you know he, he's he's setting off in a a bit of a, a goal of the season competition all all by himself, isn't he? Um, you know his his goals. I would suggest that that um, that his last three goals will will probably end up in um, you know a Sunderland end of season goal of the season competition, uh, along with Dennis Serkins. Um, so yeah, I mean he's been great, and I think he's 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 looked really dangerous um, playing through the middle. Um, he looks less dangerous when when he gets moved out wide on on the left. Um, so 
in, except in extreme circumstances, I'd, I'd be inclined if if I was Libri to um, to carry on playing him uh, through through the middle. Um, whether Mundell's injury that looked the more serious of the two uh, on Saturday, um, whether Mundell is able to play um, at Millwall, I don't know. But that then leaves. Uh, uh, a decision for the breed. Do you, do you continue with Isidore down the middle, or do you move him out to the left, or do you perhaps play Tommy Watson on on the left? You know how are you, how are you going to address that that problem? But for me, I, I think is Isidore at the moment has made himself um, you know Sunderland's first choice central striker, and and I would be loath to move him for any reason. Yeah, because I think I think you're then clearly weakening two areas. You're not only missing your best left winger, but you're taking your best centre forward out as well. It didn't it didn't work at yeah. Preston, did it? It didn't work for two yeah. reasons. Isidore on the left didn't work, which Lebri admitted afterwards. But also yeah. Watson on the right, it was a difficult game for Watson. You could not judge him at all in a game like that. No. But, but he didn't look quite as comfortable, I didn't think, as as what he does or what he has done when I've seen him playing on the left side, which is where he plays most of his football for the 21s. If Mundell's out, yes. just a straight, a straight swap with Watson feels like I know it's horses for courses and Labrice will assess Millwall's threat, but that feels yeah. like a better that will, choice, isn't it? That will be my choice. I think I think it, it's a better um, fit for, for Tommy Watson. You know, you, it, it, he's a young lad and he's he's obviously just coming into the first team picture. You know, uh, at least play him in his, his favoured position. Um, I think it's hard enough to come into a, um, a championship team as it is without being asked to to come in out of position. So I would be inclined to play him on the left, plus you get to keep his door through the middle, which is his best position. Um, and also, I, I think in, you mentioned that Preston there, I didn't think that um, Aaron Connolly was particularly great at Preston, and I didn't think he was particularly great when he came on against Coventry either. Um, he still looks quite a long way off uh, full fitness and, and being ready to come in, into the team. I know you... It's very difficult. How how do you bring somebody up to speed and up to fitness if you're not playing them? But uh, it's a very harsh em- environment, unfortunately, in the championship. And and to me, uh, he doesn't quite look ready, um, you know, to 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 step in and and uh, and go through the middle to allow you to to switch uh, Isidore out to the left. That Sirkin goal. He's 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 played every minute so far for Sunderland this season, and I've just been writing about it there. If you compare that with of this with last season and the frustrations. It was it was a year ago this week that he was forced out of the Birmingham game in the warm-up and he wouldn't play again. Obviously, a couple of months of uncertainty trying to get the bottom of the hamstring injury, surgery in the January, missed the rest of the season. Well, he's come back and there's plenty of competition. But, it, but if you're discussing who's been Sunderland's player of the season so far, Rig Rig would make a strong case. I think Metham's been excellent since he came in. Yeah. Joe Bellingham's made stride forwards. Mundell's clearly made an impact. I think I'd go Sirkin. Yeah, uh, he'd certainly be a contender. I wouldn't have him as my uh, out and out player of the season so far, but he certainly had a, a really really strong season. Um, the worry with with Dennis was always how robust he would be, whether he could play every game and as you say he's played every minute of every game up to now um so so far so good he's he's been excellent he, he uh scored a brilliant goal on on saturday that's a you know a, a great hit um against uh, coventry one that will uh, sort of live long in the memory i think for for fans um uh yeah he, he's been absolutely brilliant you know we know he's a top class um left back uh he you know, he, he was at Spurs and, um, you know, he was very highly thought of there. The only question mark was over his um, fitness and, and how long uh, or how many games he, he could play at a stretch. At the moment, he's he's playing regularly at, at Sunderland and, and let's, you know, hope that continues. I'm just trying to remember, was it was it against Millwall? Was it away against Millwall where he uh, picked up scored, concussion as well? The goal, yeah, he scored the goal and yeah. took a hit, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the season before last, wasn't it? That was the season before last, and he and he missed. So, so this game, assuming he plays down at Millwall, and let's uh, let's all hope hope he does. I mean, there'll, there'll be a, a little bit of uh, um, you know an extra edge on it for for him. You know, he'll he'll be going back there to to where he picked up an injury that uh, sort of did him quite a lot of damage two seasons ago. There's been, I'm sure you've seen links with Leeds United this week. Leeds have been linked with with Sirkin. Is is his contract, his current contract, is due to expire in twenty twenty six. That that's got to be a priority for Sunderland, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it has to be. It has to be one of the things that that, that they're looking at, that they're talking about. Um, I mean, I don't. I mean, I know that Sunderland have a model, and that um, you know, if if they get acceptable bids for their players, then they'll consider parting with them. I think in the current circumstances, they not only have to think about the model and and the saleability of their assets. They would also have to say to themselves, well, actually, we're in we're in a battle with Leeds United. Um, for automatic promotion and or a, a top six place, um, we cert- if, if we do have to part company with with Dennis Serkin, we certainly don't want it to be somebody who's a, a direct rival with us this season. I don't think fans would be uh, at all happy with that. They'd be, they'd be uh, unhappy enough at uh, having to sell the player, but quite without selling him to one of one of your direct competitors at the top of the table. Um, so I think that I mean, as we say, well, there's another. Um, you know, eighteen months or so left on that that contract, so there is time. Um, there's no there's no real urgency. Um, you know, they don't have to do anything in January. They don't have to do anything drastic in in January, um, but they've got a, a bit of time to to negotiate. And I would imagine that um, that uh, Christian Speakman will be you know uh, having those conversations with uh, Dennis and Dennis's people. I was going to say you'd, you'd be amazed, wouldn't you, if that situation hadn't been resolved by the end of the season some of them won't want to be going or certainly by the start of next season some of them won't want to be going in the next season with with Sirkin in the last year of his contract that I'd, I'd be staggered if it got to the end of this season and Sirkin hadn't signed a new deal yeah I mean it seems that with lots of these contracts though particularly the ones that, that we immediately flag up and say this is a big issue and it needs to be addressed quickly um they seem to be the ones that aren't addressed quickly or, or aren't resolved quickly anyway. I'm not saying that there's nothing happening, I'm, but they certainly don't get sorted quickly because, uh, you know, the player is in quite a position of strength. He can sit back and and, and wait and uh, he knows that the, the clock is ticking and, and it almost becomes a, a bit of a, a Mexican standoff, doesn't it, uh, um, between club and player? The, the club knows that, uh, you know the, the player's value is is um, going down as the nears the end of his contract and enters the final year of his contract, um, and the and the player knows that he's getting a stronger hand all the time. So um, so yeah, it does seem to to take a bit of extra time um, to resolve these things. But you would hope that given the way that um, you know I, I think I think uh, Dennis Serkin has been treated very well by Sunderland and he's been looked after and. Um, uh, you know, to what extent that uh, uh, that will count in in the modern game, I don't know. But I would I would hope that that that's factored into the decision from from his part. Um, and I would also hope, uh, you know, looking at the other side of it, that Sunderland make him an offer that that um, reflects his worth as well. You know, Sunderland can't uh, um, rely on being able to keep players um, at less than the market value. They have to pay them what they're worth. We've got some quotes from Sirkin um, on are Sunderland, depending on whether you're watching or, or, or depending on when, sorry, you're watching or listening to this. They'll be online um, on the site on, on Friday morning in which Sirkin looks back on the difficulties of last season. And he and he talks about Luke O'Neill and thanks Luke O'Neill for his support. And there was, a, there was a line in there that I had to check um, because I didn't do the interview with Sirkin. I was sent, sent the quotes, you know what it's like after a game, yeah. div, divvy the kind of resources up. Um, yeah. And he's talking about O'Neill and saying how big of character he is behind the scenes, and then says, um, "Ask the lads we had in from from SAS. He was he was uh, it, non-stop at them for a couple of hours." And I'm thinking, "What's the context here?" So I had to get in touch with someone at the club to find out, and it turns out there'd been visitors from is it SAS. Who dares wins the program? Uh, yes, yeah, I remember something of, uh, about that. Yeah, yeah, and they'd yeah. been they'd been in. I think they'd done an event at the stadium like last week and got in the dressing room or, or been in the training ground and spoke to the players beforehand. And uh, Sirkin had said that Luke O'Neill was um, chewing the lugs off for a couple of hours trying to get everything out. But Tony Mowbray used to say that, didn't he? Tony Mowbray used to say that he'd have Luke in for his meetings after games or before games or after sessions yeah. and. He'd be like intensely, it was all complimentary, kind of intensely wanting to kind of analyze the ins and outs of everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Captain. I, w- I want to talk about Mowbray, but first, um, January, you, me- you mentioned January there and, and, and kind of how the last few games have shown us what Sunderland might need to do. Is there anything yeah. specific, looking ahead to January, are there any specific positions you think in right backs, one that's staring at us with, with Hume? Yeah. 
uh, having no cover for that for that Millwall game or no obvious cover. But are there any obvious positions, or or is it just kind of fleshing the squad out with more bodies? Yeah, I mean, right back is is the obvious area that that we're all you know looking at and thinking about now. Um, but Sunderland actually seem in, in quite decent shape. Bear in mind that we haven't yet seen a couple of the players that did come in over the summer. So there are a couple of bodies who, you know, uh, will will you know come into the picture um, as time goes on. Um, obviously, we still don't know. I, I mean, there's the the young. Um, uh, uh, midfielder, isn't there? Whose name just Samed. temporarily escapes yeah, me? Samed. Yeah, Ali Samed yeah. hasn't played yet. Abdullah yeah. Hayy, obviously, and, hasn't played yet. Yeah, and um, and uh, Milan Alexic, the midfielder. Yeah. So, yeah. so we haven't seen him. Um, so we're not able to to make a proper uh, judgment about how they they're going to fit into the squad and where, where exactly they are, whether they'll be a part of things this season, whether they were bought with an eye to the future or exactly what. So there are bodies there that we haven't even seen yet. Um, so, you know, that has to be factored in as well. But yeah, I mean, Sunderland, you know, do need to, to make sure that they're well equipped going into this second half of the season because they're giving themselves such a great platform, you know, assuming they, they carry on between now and, and the start of January, which is only what, six weeks away, um, six weeks or so away. Um, they're giving themselves such a great platform. It would be a shame to get bogged down with injuries and suspensions come, you know, January, February, March and, and see it. To, you know, start to fade away. Um, you know, they should certainly, uh, you know, uh, they should certainly be challenging for a top six place. Um, you know, right the way to the end end of the season, and, and hopefully better, hopefully top two place. Um, the, the the question is going going to be if Sunderland are in a in a decent position come January, and there's every reason to believe they will be. Will uh, the club push the boat out and you know go go you know the, the sort of extra you know, dig a bit deeper so that they can, so they've got the strength that they need. Are that's you going to get? That's opportunity? the big question. Yeah, because are you going to get an opportunity like this one again? I think the general consensus was before the season started that the championship might not be as strong as it has been in the last yeah. in the previous seasons, and 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 I, and I think we've seen that so far. Sunderland yeah. have been have been excellent. That, that's not to take anything yeah. away from what Sunderland have achieved so far, but but yeah. I don't think there's a there's a Leicester or a Southampton yeah. or a Leeds. No. I think Leeds are as strong this season as they were last yeah. year. You mentioned there if Sunderland get to January and they're still in such a strong position. Well, this coming run of games will tell us a lot, won't it? Millwall away, West Brom home, Sheffield United away. I mean, those three in themselves. Yeah. Then Stoke and Bristol City look on paper like opportunities. Those next three yeah. games. Yeah, and we've seen how quickly things can change in the space of a week and three games. You know, Sunderland were five points clear at the top, and then at the end of three games, they're suddenly uh, top only by goal difference. So you and they haven't lost in those three games. So you can see how quickly you know three results, um, you know, even in the space of uh, of seven or eight days, whatever it was, um, can completely um, you know change the picture. So you know this is a, a crucial run of games against teams who are directly competing with Sunderland, uh, you know, around the top of the, the table. And, and that's going to be, um, you know, a real key. Because I think, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head here, uh, I don't think Sunderland have played too many of the of the teams in the top 10, have they? Burnley? Yeah, I don't uh, know. I mean, Burnley, Leeds, Borough. Burn, Burnley and Leeds. Yeah, OK, maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wrong. But, but yeah, um, so... Um, I didn't think they they had, but yeah. Now you started to list them, perhaps, perhaps so. But yeah, so, but certainly this is a this is a, a a tough run of fixtures, and it's going to going to tell us a lot because you have to test yourself against the the top teams. Now, up to now, the the teams that Sunderland have played, the ones that you've just mentioned. I mean, obviously Sunderland beat Middlesbrough, they drew against Leeds, and they beat Burnley. So you know they've had very very good results against the teams near near the top of the table. Um, so let's hope that um, you know that that will continue and and they can do that in these next three games. Mentioned Tony Mowbray there. I don't know whether you'd seen or heard, but Mowbray being a special guest at Middlesbrough's game at the weekend on BBC I did TV. See, yeah. And, and yeah, joined the lads at BBC TV before the game and, and 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 did kind of an extended interview and then and then stuck around for the game as well. Um, if you haven't seen it or heard it yet. I can well imagine that you're not going to want to stick around and listen to the Borough commentary, but listening to Mowbray's 
interview beforehand is absolutely well worth your time because he was excellent. He talked openly and honestly about the difficulties of the last year uh, and, and the strong and clear message was if, if anything doesn't feel right health-wise, go and get it checked. Um, yeah. And I was looking at the response on um, um, Twitter to BBC Teasers to BBC, BBC Teaser put a clip out and I'm looking at the response and what struck me was ob obviously the strength of goodwill and feeling for Tony but the fact yeah. that it came from, from everywhere he's, he's such a unique case isn't he and that he's yeah. so well he's so well thought of so fondly thought of at every club he's been associated with clearly including yeah. Sunderland and it, it's great to hear him and see him looking well and hopefully through the worst of it after the difficult yeah. last year, the difficult doesn't come close, does it? After the last year, yeah, yeah, um, absolutely fantastic to see Tony back, um, back there at uh, the Riverside, and it was good to see him earlier on at the season. He was a guest at the stadium of like two, um, you know, fantastic to see him him back, uh, um, back up, up, you know, out and about and at football again. And I'm sure it won't be too long before he's back in the game again, knowing what he's like as a character. He's not going to uh, want to sit out for any longer than he has to um but yeah i mean he's well regarded wherever he goes i, th I don't think that anywhere where, where you look back across his former clubs um as player or manager uh in actual fact i don't think that there's there are many people that, that have a word, bad word to say against him uh he seems one of those um you know characters and and personalities that's, that's loved wherever he goes um you know even up here we, we you know we've we've seen we know that um you know that there can be uh it can be difficult when you've got, um, you know, a T sider managing on Weir side, or uh, you know, yeah, a Geordie managing on Weir side, or whatever it might be. You know, I know what I'm, I'm trying to get to. You know, there, there are inter club rivalries and all the rest of it. Um, but Tony seems to transcend all, all that, and he's, and he's wished well wherever he goes, and that's, and that's lovely to see. You know, absolutely fantastic, and, um, and as you say, he's. he's sent out a message if anything doesn't feel right then you should get yourself checked and he's not the only footballer that's uh you know in our orbit up here that that speaks that way i mean i was doing a a, a walking um to raise money for prostate cancer a few weeks ago with uh, mick harford and gary bennett um you know and similar kind of of, of theme you know and these things you know that these guys have got serious messages to send out to to blokes you know um if things don't feel right you know get yourself checked whatever it might be on, on tony i mean god knows how many managers you worked with and dealt with during your time covering 21 21, 21. <laughs> there, there can't have been many more as a bloke i'm on about here forget forget the football side of things as a bloke there can't have been any many more likable and genuine than Tony Mowbray. No, um, you know that the, there have been lots of uh, several managers that I've really enjoyed working with, and uh, um, you know they've been great with me, and I've had a good relationship with. Um, you know, everybody from Peter Reid, you know, you, know um, you can imagine foot forward, and people like Jack Ross, more recent times, and, and what have you. Great, but yeah, just Tony for his uh, for his genial nature uh always great company and also as somebody that that i grew up um you know in the era when he was playing and uh you know he would have been at, at middlesbrough in the 80s as i was growing up as and, and i can remember him and gary pallister and uh you know i remember gary pallister going to manchester united and all, all the rest of it um so you, you could have a laugh and a joke and, and it, it used to make me laugh because um you know, I started out covering some of them when I was in my early twenties, and by the by the time I finished doing that on a weekly basis, I'm you know a man of more mature years. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so, well so, the, the, so, so there were times when myself and Tony were the two oldest people in the room. <laughs> you know, at the, at the Academy of Light, and um, we'd be talking ab about clips and incidents from matches in the eighties and in early nineties, and. Uh, you know, we'd be saying, "Oh, do you remember this? And do you remember that?" And he'd just shake his head and say, "God, these these lads don't know they're born, do they?" You know, and you looked at the pitches they played on and the, and the rest of it. You know, and and it was just fabulous, fabulous. You know, great company, great crack. You know, it was really, really uh, good fun to be around. I think that's part of the reason why I was so so sorry and sad when he uh, when he left. Yeah, and the fact that he done it's one of them, isn't it? Where when 
when when you're doing our job, you, you do kind of see it from the perspective of how helpful managers are yeah. with you. But obviously, you have to be one step removed from that. I try to be one step removed from that and judge judge what you're seeing on the pitch. Um, oh yeah. But it, but he but he did a fine job, a fine job. And and I've said this about Mowbray in the past. When you look back at his managerial record, and he said last week he he, he fully intends to get back in in the new year. I think he had a holiday yeah. plan before the year was out, but then fully intends to get back in. Ma- managers often say that they when they come into a club, they, they want to leave the club in in a better state than what they found it. Well. Yeah. Often, not all the time, but often that's them paying lip service because ultimately managers want to look after themselves and they know it's their head on the block and they've got to think in the short term. And yet Mowbray has done exactly that. When you look at how clubs have done after he'd left, yeah, kind of set the groundwork. I know it didn't work out for, for Beale at Sunderland, but yeah, players like Rig, who were given the opportunities, Hume, Sirkin, Dan Neal, so many more who flourished under Mowbray. Yeah undoubtedly set the groundwork for the success that's not taken anything yeah. away from the breeze but, but helped to pave the way for the success Sunderland are enjoying now yeah of course you know and uh, you know obviously Tony built on the inheritance that, he, that he'd got from uh, you know Alex Neal as, as well when when he came in um, the one thing I was interested to tie the two threads together you mentioned January um, you know before we started talking about Tony there I mean Tony's big uh thing when he was at, at Sunderland for that full for, for that first season was he capitalized on where Sunderland were at the turn of the year strengthening in January for the second half of, of the season now ultimately Sunderland finished sixth that season and uh, and uh, got to the playoffs and played Luton but they didn't have a centre half by the time they reached that stage because um because of injuries and what have you you know and that cost them really dear against Luton in that playoff well, semi-final second yeah, or a centre forward, but that playoff semi final second leg. So let's hope that, you know, lessons have been learned from that so that, that Sunderland going forward this January do strengthen when they're in, in a position of strength. Um, but yeah, um, you know, just going back to, to where we started, started there, you know, you know, there's no doubt that Tony, Tony Mowbray has, has put in firm, rock solid foundations at, at Sunderland. Michael Beale was never the right choice at Sunderland and it should never have happened because they shouldn't have sacked Tony Mowbray uh, beforehand. Um, they should have backed him in the summer rather than sacked him in the December. Um, and yeah, he put in the foundations uh, for what we're seeing now. I, I still see the second half of last season, Michael Beale onwards and through Mike, Mike Dodds. Really, that was it was treading water and to, until the club could bring in a uh you know the the right manager or head coach to to follow tony mowbray and it looks like regis Labrie is that right man you know it's certainly everything we've seen so far suggests it um but yeah he is effectively taking on uh the legacy from tony excellent well great to see tony looking and sounding so well and, and possibly coming to a dugout near you if he gets his wish he says that he wants to be back in work in the new year and he certainly won't be short of suitors it's funny because i've seen various or various jobs have become available in the last couple of months stoke and cardiff both spring to mind and mowbray was Coventry, a even Coventry Coventry, now, yeah. I wondered. yeah and, and mowbray was immediately put at the top of the bookies list now I, I know they mean nothing particularly in the very early days but that happened because he's he's deemed as a good fit and, and when you go down the championship and it probably going to be in the championship there are so many clubs where you think yeah if, if they lose if they lose a manager then Mowbray will do a fine job of, of of going in there and getting things going again we'll see we'll see thanks very much to you for joining us James thank you for for watching thank listening you. do subscribe on the YouTube channel as I said at the start if you're listening on your podcast platforms and rate and review thanks again to our partners Cops Cospex Opticians and to the Fans Museum in Sunderland we'll be back next week to look ahead to the Millwall game and to the block of games coming up before Christmas, where hopefully some of them will extend that unbeaten run, but also get back to winning ways. Thanks for joining us.